The following sermon by Samuel Davies is called Lessons from the Recent Earthquake. Preached in Hanover County, Virginia, June 19, 1756. In this sermon, Davies is referring to the Great Lisbon Earthquake, which took place on November 1, 1755. Contemporary reports state that the earthquake lasted nearly six minutes, causing gigantic fixtures 15 feet wide. Approximately 40 minutes after the earthquake, an enormous tsunami engulfed the harbor in downtown. It was followed by two more waves. In the areas unaffected by the tsunami, fire quickly broke out and flames raged for five days. Tsunamis as tall as 66 feet swept the coast of North Africa and struck Martinique and Barbados across the Atlantic. Isaiah 24, verses 18 and 20. Those who flee in terror will fall into a trap, and those who escape the trap will step into a snare. Destruction falls on you from the heavens. The earth is shaken beneath you. The earth is broken down and is utterly collapsed. Everything is lost, abandoned, and confused. The earth staggers like a drunkard. It trembles like a tent in a storm. It falls and will not rise again, for its sins are very great. The works of creation and providence were undoubtedly intended for the notice and contemplation of mankind, especially when God comes out of his place, that is, departs from the usual and stated course of his providence, to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquities, then it befits us to observe the operation of his hands with fear and reverence. To this the psalmist repeatedly calls us, Come see the glorious works of the Lord. See how he brings destruction upon the earth. Psalm 46, verse 8. Come and see what God has done, how awesome his works in man's behalf. Psalm 66, verse 5. To assist you in this, I shall cheerfully devote an hour today. This world is a state of discipline for the eternal world, and therefore chastisements of various kinds and degrees are to be enumerated among the ordinary works of providence. Pain, sickness, losses, bereavements, disappointments. These are the usual scourges of the divine hand, which our Heavenly Father uses every day to chastise some or other of his wayward children. But when these are found too weak and ineffectual for their reformation, or when from their being so frequent and common that people begin to think them things of course and not to acknowledge the divine hand in them, then the universal ruler departs from his usual method of chastisements and uses such signal and extraordinary executioners of his vengeance as cannot but rouse the slumbering world and render it sensible of his agency. At such times, God throws his world into a ferment and either controls its established laws or carries such into execution as were formed only for extraordinary occasions. The extraordinary executioners of his vengeance are usually generally these four. Famine, sword, pestilence, earthquakes, a famine in this land of plenty would be an unusual judgment indeed, and yet sundry parts of our country have been reduced to the borders of it by the severity of last year's drought. The sword has been a harmless weapon to us until of late, but now it is brandished over our heads and pierces our country in a thousand veins. The pestilence is a mischief that has not spread desolation among us, though there is not perhaps one year in which it is not walking through some country or other upon our globe. As for earthquakes, we have had such shakes as may convince us that we are not beyond the reach of that desolating judgment, even on this solid continent, though they have not as yet done us any injury. But perhaps there never was, since the earthquake at the deluge that broke up the fountains of the great deep, so extensive a desolation of this kind, as has lately happened in Europe and Africa. And though, blessed be God, it did not immediately affect us, yet the very fame 
of so dreadful a judgment ought to be improved for our advantage. To this event I may accommodate the words of my text. The earth is shaken beneath you. The earth is broken down and is utterly collapsed. Everything is lost, abandoned, and confused. The earth staggers like a drunkard. It trembles like a tent in a storm. And the reason of all is, for its sins are very great. Such as you have read the public papers need not be informed of that widespreading earthquake which began on the 1st of November and has since been felt at different times through most parts of Europe. For the sake of those that have only had some imperfect hints of it, I would give you this short history. The city of Lisbon, Portugal, is now no more. Its vast riches, and by all accounts between fifty and a 100,000 people, have been buried or burnt in its ruins. Sundry other towns in Portugal, Spain, and along the European coasts of the Mediterranean have been damaged, overthrown, or sunk like Sodom and Gomorrah. The earthquake also extended across that sea and has ruined a great part of Africa, particularly in the empire of Morocco, where the large and populous cities have been demolished with many thousands of the inhabitants. It has likewise been felt in sundry parts of Italy, Germany, France, Bohemia, and even in Great Britain and Ireland. Nay, the tremor has reached our continent, and has been very sensibly felt in Boston and other parts of New England. Though much harm has not been done in those parts, yet a loud warning has been given, and oh, that it may not be given in vain. It would certainly be an instance of inexcusable stupidity for us to take no notice of so dreadful a dispensation. Such devastations are at once judgments upon the places where they happen and warnings to others. For what end were the Israelites punished with so many miraculous judgments? Paul will tell you, it was not only for their sins, but all these things happened to them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the earth are come. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 11 for what end were the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah turned into ashes? Peter will tell you. God made them an example unto those who should after live ungodly. Second Peter 2 verse 6 And shall not we regard such examples even in our own age? Shall others perish for our admonition, and shall we receive no profit by their destruction? This would be stupid and inexcusable indeed. Therefore, my present design is to direct you to such meditations as this alarming event naturally suggests, and which may be sufficient to the right improvement of it. But before I enter upon this design, I would once more inculcate upon you a doctrine which I have often proved in your hearing, and that is, that this world is a little territory of Jehovah's government, and under the management of its providence, and particularly that all the blessings of life are the gifts of his bounty, and all his calamities are the chastisements or judgments of his hand. This I would have you to apply to the event now under consideration. It is the providence of God that has impregnated the bowels of the earth with these dreadful materials that tear and shatter its frame. It is his providence which strikes the spark, which sets this dreadful train in a flame and causes a terrible explosion. There is a set of conceited, smattering philosophers risen among us who think they disprove all this by alleging that earthquakes proceed from natural causes, and therefore it is superstitious to ascribe them to the agents of providence. But there is no more reason or philosophy in this than if they should deny that a man writes because he makes use of a pen, or that kings exercise government because they employ servants under them. I grant that natural causes concur toward the production of earthquakes. But what are these natural causes? Are they independent, self-moved causes? No, they were first formed and are still directed by the divine hand. The shortest and plainest view I can give of the case is this. When God formed this globe, he saw what would be the conduct of its inhabitants in all the periods of time, and particularly he knew at what particular time a kingdom or city would be ripe for his judgments. 
and he adjusted manners accordingly. He set the train of events with so much exactness that it will spring just in the critical moment when everything is ripe for it, and thus by a preconcerted plan he answers all the occasional exigencies of the world and suits himself to particular cases without a miraculous and direct working of his own hand. Or perhaps he may sometimes think it necessary to work with his own immediate hand and to suspend or counteract the usual and stated laws of creation, that his interference may be more conspicuous. Let this truth, then, my friends, be laid deep in your minds as a foundation that earthquakes are the effects of divine providence and produce to answer some of its important ends in the world. And hence I naturally proceed, according to promise, to direct you to such meditations as are suitable to this shocking event. Now you may hence take occasion to reflect upon the majesty and power of God, the dreadfulness of God's anger, the sinfulness of our world, the distinguishing kindness of providence towards us, the destruction of this globe at the final judgment. First, let the majestic and terrible phenomenon of earthquakes put you in mind of the majesty and power of God, of the dreadfulness of his displeasure. He can toss and convulse this huge globe and shake its foundations down to the center. Trembling continents, burning or sinking mountains, wide yawning gulfs and solid ground, explosions of subterranean mines sufficient to shiver a world, are but hints of his indignation. But my language does but sink this exalted subject. I shall therefore give you the inimitable descriptions of the sacred writers. His wisdom is profound, his power is vast. Who has resisted him and come out unscathed? He moves mountains without their knowing it, and overturns them in his anger. He shakes the earth from its place and makes its pillars tremble. He speaks to the sun, and it does not shine. He seals off the light of the stars. He alone stretches out the heavens and treads on the waves of the sea. He is the maker of the bear and Orion, the Pleiades, and the constellations of the south. He performs wonders that cannot be fathomed, miracles that cannot be counted. Job 9, verses 4 to 10. For a fire has been kindled by my wrath, one that burns to the lowest hell. It will devour the earth in its harvest and set a fire to the foundations of the mountains. I will heap calamities upon them and spin my arrows against them. Deuteronomy 32, verses 22 and 23. But the most striking and lively description, methinks, which the language of inspiration itself has given us, is in the prophecy of Nahum. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord takes vengeance and is filled with wrath. The Lord takes vengeance on his foes and maintains his wrath against his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. The Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. His way is in the whirlwind and the storm, and clouds are the dust of his feet. The mountains quake before him and the hills melt away. The earth trembles at his presence, the world and all who live in it. Who can withstand his indignation? Who can endure his fierce anger? His wrath is poured out like fire. The rocks are shattered before him. Nahum 1, 2, and 6. And is this the being who is so little thought of in our world? Is this he whose name passes for the lightest trifle? whose word can hardly engage men's attention, whose authority is ridiculed, whose wrath is scorned, whose laws are audaciously violated, whose threatenings are despised. Is this he who is complimented with empty, spiritless formalities under the name of religion? Oh, is this he whom we are met this day to worship? What? And shall there be no more attention and solemnity among us? Can anything be more unnatural, more impious, or more shocking? 
Indeed, sirs, it strikes me with horror to think how contemptuously this glorious, almighty, and awesome God is treated in our world. Angels do not treat him so. Nay, even devils in the height of their malice dare not thus trifle with him. They tremble at his very name. Oh, why does the wicked man revile God? Why does he say to himself, He won't call me to account? Psalm 10, verse 13. See, here is your antagonist. His wisdom is profound. His power is vast. Who has resisted him and come out unscathed? Job 9, verse 4. This earth is as nothing in his hands. Surely the nations are like a drop in a bucket. They are regarded as dust on the scales. He weighs the islands as though they were fine dust. Isaiah 40, verse 15. He who can shake this huge globe to the center. He who can bury proud cities with all their inhabitants in the bowels of the earth. He who can toss the ocean into a ferment and cause it to overwhelm the guilty land. He who can hurl the tallest mountains from their everlasting foundations into the sea or sink them into the valleys or pools of water. He who has stored the bowels of the earth as with magazines of gunpowder and can set it all in blaze or burst it into ten thousand fragments. He who can arm the tiniest creature, a gnat or a worm, to be your executioner and has an absolute power over the most mighty and ungovernable elements. Oh, what will he make of you when he takes you in hand? Can you rest easy one moment while you have reason to fear that the supreme Lord of the universe is your enemy for your willful provocations in his name in his glorious and fearful name has any weight with you i charge you to seek his favor make him your friend and dare to rebel against him no more dare you continue to rebel against him or careless about pleasing him while you walk on his ground while you breathe in his air, while you feed upon his provisions, while you live in his territories as within the reach of his arm, why he can make that earth you pollute with your sins, open its dreadful jaws and swallow you up alive like horror in his company. Number 16, verse 32. Oh, my friends, it may break our hearts to think there should be any people so mad as to incur his displeasure and be careless about his favor. But alas, are there not some such among us? Well, they will soon find that it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God unless they speedily repent. Hebrews 10, verse 31. Secondly, this desolating judgment may justly lead you to reflect upon the sinfulness of our world. Alas, we live upon a guilty globe, and much has it suffered for the sins of its inhabitants. Once it was all drowned in a universal deluge, and many parts of it have since sunk under the load of guilt. If sin had never defiled it, then it would never have been thus torn and shattered. We have seen that these judgments are at the disposal of divine providence, and we are sure a righteous providence would never inflict them needlessly. It is sin, my friends, which is the source of all the calamities that oppress our world from age to age. It is sin which has so often convulsed it with earthquakes. Do but observe the language of my text on this head. The earth is shaken beneath you. The earth is broken down and is utterly collapsed. Everything is lost, abandoned, and confused. The earth staggers like a drunkard. It trembles like a tent in a storm. It falls and will not rise again, for its sins are very great. This, sirs, this is the burden under which it totters. This is the evil at which it trembles. This is the load which men, which the earth itself, nay, which angels and the whole creation cannot bear up under. Why was the old world destroyed by a deluge? It was because all flesh had corrupted their way. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. Genesis 6.5 why was Sodom consumed with lightning from heaven and sunk into a dead sea by an earthquake? It was because the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Genesis 13, verse 13. In short, 
Sin is the cause of all the calamities under which our world has grown from the fall of Adam to this day. Heaven has been testifying its displeasure against the sins of men by the most terrible judgments from age to age for nearly 6,000 years. The destruction of one nation is intended not only for their punishment, but for a warning to others that they may hear and be afraid. And no one among you will do such an evil thing again. Deuteronomy 13 verse 11 but men will still obstinately persist on alarm by the loudest warnings and unreformed by the severest chastisements. Let the sword of war slay its thousands. Let the pestilence walk about it in all its desolating terrors. Let the earth shake and tremble under its guilty inhabitants. Let these judgments be repeated from generation to generation, from country to country. And still they will sin on, and the chastisements of six thousand years have not been able to reform them. Oh, what a rebellious province of Jehovah's empire is this guilty globe. And probably it has been seldom more so than in the present age. And therefore it is no wonder that the judgments of God are in the earth. The greatest part of it is overrun with all the idolatry and ignorance, vice and barbarity of heathenism. A great part of it worships the impostor Muhammad instead of the Son of God and groan under his yoke. This is the character of the empire of Morocco and those African territories that have been ravaged by the late earthquake. They are either superstitious heathens or deluded Mohammedans, and a knowledge of God is not to be found among them. The greatest part of Europe is corrupted with the idolatry, superstition, and debaucheries of the Church of Rome, and groans under its tyranny. There the most foolish theatrical farces are devoutly performed under the name of religion. There the free-born mind is enslaved and dare not think for itself in manners in which it must answer for itself. There the homage due to the true God and the only mediator is sacrilegiously given to senseless idols and a rabble of imaginary saints. There the infernal court of the Inquisition imitates the tortures of hell and makes a man who would discover the truth a monument of misery. There a market for indulgences and pardons is held, and men for a little money may buy a license to commit the most atrocious crimes, or they make atonement for them by the penance of bodily austerities. And can pure and undefiled religion, can good morals grow and flourish in such a soil? No religion has degenerated into priestcraft and a mercenary superstition, and the most enormous vices and debaucheries must abound. Such, alas, was Lisbon by universal character. And though I would not repeat the censorious sins of the Jews with regard to the Galileans, Luke 13, 2, nor suppose that Lisbon was more deeply guilty than all the cities upon the face of the earth, yet this I dare pronounce that it was a very guilty spot of the globe, and that it was for this that it was so severely punished. If we take a survey of Protestant countries where religion is to be found, if anywhere at all, alas, how melancholy is the prospect, the good old doctrines of the Reformation which were adapted to advance the honors of divine grace and mortify the pride of man have been too generally abandoned and a more easy system agreeable to the vanity and self-flattery of depraved hearts has been dressed up in their stead. Nay, Christianity itself has been rejected, ridiculed, and exposed to public scorn by the increasing club of deists. And where the Christian name and profession are retained, a life and spirit are too generally lost, and their practice is an open opposition to their professed faith. How are the ordinances of the gospel neglected or profane? What a shocking variety of crimes are to be found everywhere, even in countries that profess to have renounced popery for its corruptions, drunkenness, swearing, perjury, lying, fraud, and injustice pride, luxury, various forms of lewdness, and all manner of extravagances, and all these expressly forbidden under the severest penalties by that religion which they themselves profess and acknowledge to be divine. And thus they continue, 
in spite of warnings and chastisements, in spite of mercies and instructions, they have sinned on, impenitent and incorrigible for a length of many years. God is but little regarded in the world, which owes its existence and all its blessings to his power and goodness. Jesus is but little regarded, even though in those countries that profess his name. And is it any wonder the earth trembles when the iniquity thereof lies so heavy upon it? Is it not rather a wonder that it is not burst to pieces long ago and buried its guilty inhabitants in its ruins? Is there a supreme ruler over the kingdoms of men? And shall he not testify his displeasure against their rebellion? Shall he always tamely submit to such contemptuous treatment? And shall he always look on and see his government insulted and his vengeance defied? No, at proper seasons he will come forth out of his place. He will depart from the stated course of his providence to punish them for their iniquities. The convulsions of the earth, the inundations of the sea, and the sword of war shall at once proclaim and execute his displeasure. If our country has escaped the devastations of the earthquake, it is not owing to our innocence, but to the distinguishing mercy and patience of God. And therefore, thirdly, this melancholy event may carry your minds gratefully to reflect upon the peculiar kindness of God towards our country, and that it was not involved in the same destruction. I need not tell you that we are a guilty, obnoxious people. You may be convinced of it by more authentic evidence. The lives of the generality proclaim it aloud. The terrors of war that now surround us proclaim it. And do not your own consciences whisper the same thing? And why have we been spared? How has even this solid continent borne up under the load of guilt that burdens it? It has been owing entirely to the grace and patience of that God, who is so little regarded among us. And shall we not gratefully celebrate his praises? Shall not his goodness lead us to repentance? Shall all his kindness be thrown away upon us? Will we constrain him to pour out his judgments upon us also at last? Methinks I hear him expostulating over Virginia in that compassionate language. How shall I give you up, Virginia? How can I let you go? How can I destroy you like Adma and Zaboim, cities that were destroyed with Sodom and Gomorrah? My heart is torn within me, and my compassion overflows. Hosea 11, verse 8. Oh, must not such moving language melt us down at his feet in a most sincere repentance and engage us to his service for the future? Without a spirit of prophecy, I may safely pronounce it will never be well with our country until we are brought to this. But fourthly, that which I would particularly suggest to your thoughts from the devastations of the late earthquake is the last universal destruction of our world at the final judgment. Of this, an earthquake is both a confirmation of human reason and a lively representation. Number one, it is a confirmation even of human reason drawn from the constitution of our globe that such a destruction is possible and even probable according to the course of nature. Our globe is stored with subterranean magazines of combustible materials which need but a spark to produce a violent explosion and rend and burst it to pieces. What huge quantities of these sulfurous and nitrous mines must there be when one discharge can spread a tremor over half the world, bury islands and cities and shatter wide extended continents? What an inexhaustible store of fire and brimstone has supplied Mount Etna, Mount Vesuvius? and other burning volcanoes that have been belching out torrents of liquid fire for some thousands of years, and now rage as furiously as ever. Let but the subterranean magazines in every cave and cranny of the globe be set in a blaze. Let the central fire but break loose. Let all the combustible materials near or upon the surface of the earth be once inflamed. Turf, coal, trees cities, houses, and all their furniture. This would produce a general conflagration which nothing could resist. In short, we may conjecture from the construction of our world that it was not intended for a perpetual existence in its present form, 
but to be dissolved by the dreadful element of fire. And Revelation assures us of this universal desolation, when the heavens shall be shriveled up like a parched scroll, and pass away with a great noise. And the element shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also, and the things that are therein shall be burnt up. Second Peter 3 verse 10 an earthquake is also a lively representation of the universal ruins of that day, and the horror and consternation of mankind. Let imagination form a lively idea of the destruction of Lisbon, the ground trembling and heaving and roaring with subterranean thunders, towers, palaces and churches tottering and falling, the flames bursting from their ruins and setting all in a blaze, the sea roaring and rushing over its banks with resistless impetuosity, the inhabitants running from place to place in wild consternation in search of safety, or falling on their knees and rending the air with their wild shrieks and cries, flying into the strongest buildings for shelter, but crushed in their ruins or to the sea, and there swept away by the rushing waves, walls falling upon thousands in their flight, or the earth opening her jaws and swallowing them up. Can human imagination represent anything more shocking? In other calamities, whatever else we lose, we have still the earth to support us. But when that is gone, we are helpless indeed and must sink into immediate destruction. Such, my friends, but infinitely more dreadful will be the terrors of that last, that universal earthquake, which we shall all see. Stars drop, rush lawless through the air, and dash one another to pieces. The sun is extinguished and looks like a huge globe of solid darkness. The moon is turned into blood and reflects a portentous, sanguinary light upon the earth. The clouds flash and blaze with streets of lightning and are rent with a horrid crash of thunder. This is echoed back by the subterranean thunders that murmur, rumble, and roar underground. The earth is tossed like a ball and burst asunder like a moldering clod. See the yawning gulfs open, the flames bursting forth from the center, and a horrid confusion of fire and smoke rolling through the arch of heaven. See the works of nature and art perishing in one promiscuous ruin, mountains sinking and bursting out into so many volcanoes vomiting up seas of liquid fire, rocks dissolving and pouring their melted mass into the channels of the rivers, pyramids, towers, palaces, cities, forests, and plains, burning in one gigantic, indistinguishable blaze, the seas evaporating and vanishing away through the intenseness of the heat, a mixed, confused heap of sea and land, floods of water and torrents of melted rocks. Now the earth is turned upside down, inside out, and reduced into one gigantic chaos. And where, you hardy, presumptuous sinners who can now despise the terrors of the Lord, oh, where will you flee in this tremendous day? What shall support you when the ground on which you stand is gone? What rock or mountain shall you procure to shelter you when rocks and mountains are sinking and disappearing or melting away like snow before the sun? How can you expect to escape hell when the earth itself is turned into a lake of fire and brimstone? Oh, how can you bear the thought of rolling and weltering there? What has now become of your lands and possessions on which you once set your hearts? Nay, where is the country? Where the continent in which you once dwelt, alas, they are all reduced into ashes. And is there no safety in this wreck of nature? Are all mankind involved in this general ruin? No, blessed be God, there are some who shall be safe and unhurt, while the frame of nature is dissolving around them. Those happy souls who choose the Lord for their portion and Jesus for their Savior, and who in this tottering world look for a city that has foundations firm, on shaken foundations, they shall be safe beyond the reach of this general desolation. Their happiness lies secure in a kingdom which cannot be moved. Hebrews 12:28. There is a new heaven and a new earth prepared for them. Then, my friends, you will see the advantage of that despised, neglected thing, true religion, and the difference between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serves the Lord and him that serves him not. 
Malachi 3.18, Then those that are now so unfashionable as to make religion a serious business will smile secure at a dissolving world. Then they will find the happy fruits of those hours they spent on their knees at the throne of grace, of those cries and tears they poured out after Jesus, of their honest struggles with sin and temptation, and in short, of a life devoted to God. But oh, where shall the ungodly and sinner appear? Oh, where shall some of you, my dear people, appear in that dreadful day? I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, and I'm really afraid for some of you. Do you not know in your own consciences that you are generally thoughtless and careless about the great concerns of your eternal state? Your hearts have never been thoroughly changed by divine grace, nor do you know by experience what it is to believe, to repent, and to love God with all your hearts. You do not make conscience of every duty. I mean you neglect the worship of God in your families, though under the strongest obligations to perform it perhaps from your own solemn vows and promises. You indulge yourselves in some known sin or other, and if you feel some pangs of repentance, your repentance does not issue in reformation. Alas, my friends, is this a character of one soul within the hearing of my voice? Then I must tell you that if you continue such, you will be fuel for the last universal fire and must perish in the ruins of the world you have loved so well. I must tell you frankly, I studied this part of my discourse with an anxious heart, and I was almost discouraged from adding this exhortation to it, for I thought I have given such exhortations over and over, but they seem generally in vain. There is indeed a happy number among my hearers who I doubt not have regarded the gospel preached by my lips. But alas, as to the rest, I have been so often disappointed that I now hardly hope to succeed. These, my dear friends, are my discouragements and my retirements when no eye sees me but God. And, O oh, sinners, will your future conduct prove that there was good reason for my fears? Alas, is the ministry of the gospel a useless institution with regard to you? Has such exhortations as these no weight with you? Will you resist my benevolent hand when I would stretch it forth to pluck you out of the burnings? Well, my friends, I cannot help it. If you will perish, if you are obstinately set upon it, I have only this to say, that your poor minister will weep in secret for you and drop his tears upon you as you are falling into ruin from between his hands. Yes, sinners, God forbid that I should cease to pray for you and pity you, while my tongue is capable of pronouncing a word and you think it worth your while to hear me. I will send the calls of the gospel after you, and if you perish after all, you shall drop into hell with the offers of heaven in your ears.